Welcome back to the Arise interview, where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Now, you might have heard us talking earlier about the BBC Proms, the world's greatest classical music festival, which this year has been taking place at the Royal Albert Hall in London. Well, my next guest, Kalena Bovel, is one of the musicians who are key to the success of this year's Prom conducting the Chineke Orchestra in a perfectly synchronized performance of the music of Samuel Coleridge Taylor and Fela Shoande. The conductor is of course the person who directs the orchestra, communicating to the performers by motions of a baton, his or her interpretation of the music, directing the musicians on how they should hit a note or hold a beat. Conductor Kalena Bovel captured the varied moods of the music of the different composers with a delicacy and tenderness that truly moved the spirit. And I'm suitably delighted to say that the American conductor, Kalena Bovel, joins me now from London. You are in London, I hope. No, actually, I am currently back in the States. I'm back in Tennessee. That was a, that was a quick trip to London, wasn't it? <laughs> I mean, so I, I conduct the Memphis Youth Symphony here and my kids have auditions this weekend. So it was incredibly important that I get back to acclimate back to the States and then also get ready for auditions this weekend. Well, we're, we're glad you, you, you were able to make it to the proms. We're, we're all big fans of the BBC proms. And uh, uh, I understand that that was your debut, uh, your, your sort of proms debut, not your debut as a conductor, but your debut at the proms. What was it like? Oh man, it was amazing. I mean, it was it was such an incredible experience, and I didn't really, um, I couldn't really, I guess, guess the the magnitude or gauge the magnitude of how huge this opportunity was until I got out of my Uber and I just saw the space. I mean, it, it was incredible. And I mean, is 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 it obviously classical music is is a European tradition, and and a lot of it in sort of the Germanic sort of cultures of, you know, Austria, sort of Germany, the UK, that sort of thing. Is it that big in America as well? No, and that's what's interesting. I mean, the prom is not a part of American culture. Uh, and so honestly, I was not, I mean, I was aware of the proms because as I was, as I was coming up as a classical musician, you know, I would have teachers who would show us videos and performances from the prom. But in terms of our classical music culture, I mean, it's it's not something that is really spoken about. And so honestly, I didn't really get to know the true history and the vast history of the prom until about a couple of months ago when I was asked to if I would be available to conduct a performance. Well, uh, we're really glad that you did. And I mean, the, the, your, 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 the work you did there was absolutely superb. I, wa I watched it. I mean, it really brought out the best, especially given the, the people, the composers that, that you mm -hmm. sort of um, uh, were sort of doing their music there. And obviously, you've done extremely well in your chosen field. I mean, you're currently, I believe, the assistant conductor of the Memphis Symphony Orchestra. Um, but of course, you, you, you told us about the fact that, you know, the proms and all the rest of it is not that popular in America. How did you come to classical music? I mean, it was honestly a mistake. So I started singing when I was nine years old and I was convinced that I was going to be a singer. You know, my friends and I in elementary school, we had a singing group. We would write our own songs. We would go around to different classrooms and sing our own songs. Uh, and then when I got to middle school, which is sixth grade in the States, uh, I was put into a beginning strings class by accident. I wanted to be in the choir, but because the schedules didn't align, it was, no, you're going to be in this beginning strings class. I didn't know anything about the orchestra families. Uh, it was a completely new world to me. And so my teacher at the time, he went around to every student, asked us what we wanted to play. And again, not knowing anything about strings, I said, well, I want to play the flute. And he kind of looked at me, called me an idiot, and he said, go get a violin. I said, okay, this, this is my new life. And that's honestly how I came to classical music. And, you know, when I first started playing violin, I just fell in love with it. I never wanted to put my instrument down. And it was something that I just kind of told myself it at 11 is when I started playing. I said, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. But then um, I have a physical body that's very prone to injuries. So I kept getting tendonitis uh, and had bouts of carpal tunnel in both of my forearms, which are all under control now. 
but it wasn't until I got to undergrad when I started uh, conducting. So I was a music education major and at my university, all music ed majors had to take a year of instrumental conducting. So when I took the course, it was all about, you know, how do you move your hands? How do you study a score? How do you interact with people? But the first time I stepped on the podium and just gave a downbeat and, you know, my colleagues were either playing or singing for me. I just remember thinking, my God, what is this? And why am I just now discovering this? And that's when I said, okay, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And well, I've been I have to say, since. we are absolutely ecstatically delighted that you decided to choose to do that for the rest of your life. And I understand that as, I mean, you've done, as I said, very well at it. I mean, I understand that as of 2020, you were the only African-American Hispanic conductor in the U.S. Is that still the case or has it changed? That might still be the case. I'm not entirely sure. I mean, what's difficult about that is I have the platform to become more visible and have become more visible. And so I'm sure there are other Afro Latinas out there, but they may not have the same platform and visibility that, that I do. So I am sure they exist, but they just haven't been able to be seen yet. And of course, uh, as we as we mentioned, Kalena, you, you, you were conducting all these legendary um, composers in London mm -hmm. at the proms. I mean, let's take one of them, Florence Price, who is uh, an African-American woman uh, undergoing some sort of a revival at the moment. How important is it that she's finding her voice again in classical music through people like yourself? Oh, I think it's so incredibly important, you know, because I feel as though, especially now with what has happened with the murder of George Floyd, there has been this social unrest but there's also been kind of this upheaval where people are realizing how complacent we have become in regards to the music that is programmed within the classical canon. And so now people are doing the work to find these underrepresented voices, to find these marginalized voices, to find, to find the people who have basically been lost or forgotten. So I think it's so important and that it's incredibly amazing that Florence Price and her music is starting to be um, performed again within the classical canon. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, you, you're not just, I mean, a conductor, of course, as you said, you're, you're, a, you're also a musician, you're a singer, and you're also a poet. You, you wrote some very interesting poetry. Tell us about that. Oh, well, I started writing poetry uh, in, oh, heavens, I think it was 2008 was when I wrote my first poem. Uh, basically, poetry came as another way for me um, to be a creative outlet. So I battled a very hard depression for five years. And, you know, I was going through therapy, but I also refused to take any type of medication because I basically told myself, if I'm going to overcome this, then I need to be able to feel my humanity. And so poetry was a way for me to kind of say and speak about all of the things that I couldn't say verbally. Um, so now when I write my poems, it's from the standpoint of, you know, just being able or having other people being able to relate to my words. Uh, but then also it's just it's just another form of creativity for me and i just i love you know just being a being this creative person well as i said we're glad that you are this creative person but returning to your work as a conductor i mean we talked about florence price uh, you also conducted a performance of Samuel Coleridge Taylor uh, Hiawatha's wedding feast um, which is, I mean, an absolute masterpiece. And you did that with the Chineke Orchestra. How exciting was that? Oh, that was incredible. So Sam Accord Taylor is one of my favorite composers. And I didn't discover, like really discover his music until I performed the ballad in A minor. So I had a community orchestra in New Haven, uh, Connecticut, where I was living before moving to Memphis. And I was able to conduct the ballad with that group. It was called the Civic Orchestra of New Haven. But then when um, Chichin Wanaku, the founder and director of Chinike, had asked me if I was available to conduct a project last November, it also had the ballad. And so that's when I really started to understand, get to know his music even more. And I just, I love what he has to say. And I will say this, the symphony, his first symphony in A minor is honestly just one of my favorite pieces by him. Well, absolutely. But I, I hope there'll be more performances with the Chineke Orchestra, because, I mean, 
the combination of you guys together. I mean, you represent such a hopeful future for you know people of ethnicity in the world, particularly in, in Europe and in the United States. I mean, it was one of the most extraordinary things I've watched, uh, watching you sort of conduct that orchestra. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, I, I honestly love working with Chinike. It is such an amazing group. And it also feels very much like a family, you know, and so I am so grateful to Chichi for inviting me for this proms um, opportunity, but then also just for supporting my talent and for nurturing my talent, because I know that I wouldn't have, again, this visibility of the prom if it weren't for Chichi and for Chinike. Well, absolutely. But I mean, you, you were telling us about classical music in, in America. Is it unusual to have a classical orchestra that's made up of predominantly people of color? It's not unusual. Um, there actually is an organization in California called the Southeast Symphony, uh, which is predominantly based, uh, predominantly comprised of musicians of color. And I used to play in this orchestra when I was in high school. And what's interesting was, you know, as a high school student, it never really dawned on me just the impact that SESA, as it was called, was having within this community. And so it wasn't until I honestly started pursuing conducting and started seeing the visibility gaps that were existing for people of color and musicians of color that I started realizing we were doing something amazing back in the 90s, you know, with the Southeast Symphony. So it isn't unheard of, but it's still a needle that's moving very slowly in the States. Well, I wanna congratulate you for what you're doing and for the joy that you've brought into the lives of so many people. Keep doing what you're doing. Uh, I wanna thank, thank you, you exceedingly for joining us there from Tennessee. The Panamanian American Kalena Bovel, the only African-American Hispanic conductor in the US.